Hello and welcome to our webinar, Future Over Fear, Affirmative Storytelling in a New Era. I'm Janelle Tribitz, Creative Engagement Coordinator at the Opportunity Agenda, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The Opportunity Agenda is a social justice communication lab. We work with partners to move hearts and minds toward lasting policy and culture change. Today, we're going to discuss how we can move persuadable Americans to embrace diversity as a foundational value and help unify us as a country through creative storytelling and projects. We're joined today by three speakers who I'd like to thank for their time. They are Julie Fisher Rao, our Acting Director of Training, Narrative, and Journalism here at the Opportunity Agenda. Aman Ali, a stand-up comedian, storyteller, journalist, filmmaker, and co-creator of 30 Mosques in 30 Days, a Ramadan road trip across America. And Terry Marshall, a cultural strategist, facilitator, writer, and co-creator of the Creative Action Design Lab, Intelligent Mischief. We'll be taking questions during a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so feel free to enter any questions you have into the questions function on your GoToWebinar toolbar. You can join the conversation online as well by using the hashtag New Era Stories or by tweeting at OpAgenda. After the webinar, a short evaluation will pop up on your screen, so please take the time to fill that out so we can improve future webinars based on your feedback. Okay, let's get started. Our first speaker will be Julie Fisher Rao. Please go ahead, Julie. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So we're going to talk today, as Janelle said, about this idea of future over fear. And one of the reasons that we decided to do this project at the Opportunity Agenda is because we noticed, as I'm sure most of you did, over time um, during the 2016 election cycle in particular, an increase in rhetoric that was very divisive, that was um, racist, anti-immigrant, um, a lot of it <clears throat> centered on the Trump campaign that was uh, truly disturbing. And obviously all of these sentiments had existed before, but the way that they were coming together in the headlines and then the um, what was happening at, because of that was really disturbing. So you'd see kids chanting, build the wall in schools and you'd see a rise in hate crimes. And so we really wanted to take a look at what are some of the themes, what are some of the values that counter this and how can we pull those together to be telling an affirmative story so that we're not only reacting to all of the bad things that we're seeing and hearing all of the time in mainstream media and in other places. Typically when we put, start putting together recommendations around messaging and narrative, we follow a three-step process and so we did that in this case. First is to really take a look at the values and priorities of uh, folks in the field to take a look at what um, people are really wanting and needing. And we were hearing a lot of this just from our partners in the field that yes, we're noticing this, we're noticing that this rhetoric is uh, problematic um, and is really putting up barriers to a lot of the work that we're doing. So we try to do research. Um, we look at public opinion research. We try to conduct original public opinion research when we have the opportunity, look at media coverage and monitor public conversations on social media and, uh, and in other places. And then we take this all out, we develop recommendations, we take it out into the field, we provide trainings and tools, and we try to learn from how that's working. And so we follow roughly this process when trying to think of recommendations to tell this story, um, tell the story of affirmation of, of diversity instead of just reacting to the story of division and fear. And one of the, our main partners was UNIDES US, which used to be called National Council of La Raza. They were also deeply troubled by what they were hearing and wanted to do some research. And so we chose like research partners to go forward with this on. And we took a look at what kinds of messages, what kinds of values, what kinds of language put people back in the place where they were proud of the diversity in our country and saw it as a strength and wanted to um, see how we were stronger together instead of playing into the fear and being too stuck on what, you know, the us and the them divisions that we were seeing um, that were being encouraged by the divisive rhetoric. So we were able to do some focus groups. We did some um, online survey, an online survey with dial testing, which as many of you know is when people will hear a message and then you can see how they're reacting to it 
um, and it looks very much like this graph on the left, and you'll see that how very, various audiences act to the language in real time. And so we were able to do that. We oversampled African Americans, Latinos, and Millennials, and we also um, did a sample of advocates. We could see how people who were going to be going out and talking about these issues could um, were reacting to the messages that we tested. And we found some interesting things in terms of audience. Um, in terms of, we found that 33% of the folks were really our base, people who felt that diversity is important, they saw that it helped us solve problems, they see discrimination as a serious problem, and they understand that there's a role for government ensuring equal opportunity for everybody. That's 33%, and that's a bigger base than Lake had seen in a lot of these kinds of surveys, so we were encouraged by that. The opposition was a smaller, actually smaller than what Lake had seen, and again, we, we determined who the opposition was by how they answered questions about how they felt about diversity, how they, if they saw discrimination as a problem or not, and if they saw that government had a role for, um, in addressing discrimination. And they also, we had a question about whether or not people of color use racism as an excuse for failures. The opposition fell on the camp of people who believed that. And then finally, the persuadables, which are a good chunk of the American population, about half. And these folks uh, answered kind of mixed on all of those questions. So this is, these are the folks that a lot of our campaigns are looking at. Um, we always encourage taking a look at how we can both keep the base mobilized and energized and, and how we can expand the base. And, and by expanding the base, that means going over into the persuadables and trying to bring more of them into the base. And then also just make sure that the, um, the opposition is not having an effect on the persuadables, that they aren't becoming more open to the fear messages and the ideas that <clears throat> we should just you know, close our borders and exclude people and um, you know, be afraid of, of anybody who's different from us. Um, or be afraid of specific communities that were being actually named. So one of the things, ways that one of the questions that we asked was also, which of the following is the primary reason Americans have achieved, have achieved financial success? And you can see here the stark difference. Um, there's folks who are relying very much on the individual responsibility narratives um, about how hard they worked, and the uh, opposition very much is in line with that idea. And then there are the folks who see that there's a, we live in systems, we live in a society that, um, that interacts with our opportunities. And so we found that the, obviously our base believes that very strongly. Persuadables are leaning towards understanding that there's, um, that people are given, some people who have more opportunities than others, but they are more evenly split. So this is all just to give you a very, very basic idea of who some of those audiences are, um, where and how it, how that kind of falls falls together. That really the really big opposition is still just 17 percent. So really, what are the stories we can tell to get that vast 50 percent to come more closely, be more closely in line with what we're looking for, which is an idea about American diversity being making us stronger, helping us solve problems together. So we came up with three narrative goals to move forward, some ideas on how to shift the bigger stories so that they're more in line with them, what we need when we're telling our stories and, and, do, and presenting our messages. The first is to support this diversity narrative, to be thinking about how to talk about inclusion, how to be talking about that we're all connected, and so our, when we come together and share our, our different perspectives and our different backgrounds and our different cultures, we're actually stronger. And when people are attacking that, they're attacking all of us and that division weakens us. So really trying to find all the different ways we can show connections, how we're connected and how that diversity um, is a point of strength and those connections are a point of strength. Um, that we are a different people but we, have, we still have things in common. And then link diversity to problem solving and strong communities. So we did find that if you could talk about people needing to get to know each other, people coming together to solve problems, that were stronger when you bring a bunch of different voices to the table and talk to each other um, respectfully and treat each other with dignity, that we're much more likely to go, to go farther than we are when we allow people to divide us and exclude um, different 
different um, kinds of folks. And for the base and persuadables, it's important that you name that, you know, say everybody deserves a place at the table, regardless of what they look like or where they come from or what religion they are, to really name all those different kinds of points of division that the opposition is um, trying, the lines that the opposition are trying to divide us on, to really name all of those and make sure that people understand that we are just talking about, you know, a bunch of different people coming together. We're talking specifically about, you know, even you know people who look different, people who come from different places, people who speak different languages and believe different things, that they all deserve a, a voice at the table. And then finally, to find ways to introduce conversations about race and even racism. And we're seeing that if we're not talking about it, the other side is talking about it in some way or another. So to find ways to really include conversations about why, you know, if you set up the argument about why we need to be more inclusive, why we need to knock down barriers to discrimination, why we need to be a more um, inclusive uh, society that welcomes all the different voices at the table, then it makes sense that racism is being a problem is something that people want to address because you've already set up that this is the kind of society we want to be. This is a big threat to it. So finding ways to bring that in, and there's all sorts of new techniques unfortunately, that are opening up this conversation in ways that actually have not happened as much before. The overt racism gives us a place to start to talk about these things in ways that um, the narrative wasn't as open for before. So I'm going to turn it over to our guest speakers now, um, and I'm going to turn it actually back over to Janelle first. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Our guest speakers today will share projects that address the narrative goals that Julie just laid out. Their innovative work offers a creative approach to affirmative storytelling that normalizes targeted communities and popularizes a vision of the future. We will first hear from Aman Ali, whose projects showcase Muslim American communities as they are, followed by Terry Marshall, whose project immerses people in the future as it could be. So welcome, Aman and Terry. Uh, thank you for being here. Aman, we'd like to start with you uh, with Absolutely. a question. Thank you. Um, Muslim American communities have been a key target of the fear narrative. Aman, your work is a powerful example of how we can tell affirmative stories that can reframe this discourse and change how people think. Can you tell us about your projects, 30 Mosques in 30 Days, and I'm a Muslim, Ask Me Anything? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Cool. So yeah, uh, just to tell you guys a little bit about, about myself, uh, my name is Aman Ali. Uh, I live in New York City, not a native New Yorker by any means, originally from the Midwest. Uh, but I moved to New York a couple years ago, and I found out that there was close to about a million Muslims that live in New York. And I typed my address in on Google, and I found uh, 180 mosques within a 10-mile radius. And so I'm a Muslim. I fast during the month of Ramadan, and I came up to my buddy one day. And I was like, yo, wouldn't it be crazy in New York if we went to a different mosque every single day to break our fast? Uh, go to the next slide. Um, so I put out this tweet and I told my followers like, hey, because the Muslim community in New York is so big, my friend and I are going to have iftar. Iftar is just a meal to break uh, fast uh, in Islam and at a different masjid. Masjid is just a fancy word for a mosque every single day. So that was our plan. 30 days or 30 mosques in 30 days around New York. And I thought it was just going to be some stupid idea. You know, my friends would follow along, but like we were getting thousands and thousands of followers to our project. And then all of a sudden we we're getting emails like, Hey, uh, I'm in China. We love, you know, following you on, on social media or, Hey, we're in Luxembourg. We're big fans of your project. I'm like, man, I don't even know where Luxembourg is, but that's awesome that you guys are following our project. And so then the next year we wanted to change it up because we had a great time in New York, but we knew that, the diversity in New York is not exclusive to New York, that there's all these cool communities around the country we could check out. So I went to my buddy and I was like, hey, wouldn't it be even more crazy if we went to 30 states in 30 days? Can we go to the next slide? So that, this was our, our route. We literally drove to a different state every single day uh, to visit Muslim communities there. And so the first year we did you know, 30 states. Uh, and then the, can you go to the next slide? And then the, the next year after that, we finished the remaining 20 states, you know, starting Alaska, going all the way out. So, yeah, a different state uh, every single day to check out, you know, the diversity and the different communities there. And the reason I bring, you know, this up was um, there was one particular stop on the trip, and it happened in North Dakota. We were driving through North Dakota, and our, we were supposed to drive to Fargo. 
and our car breaks down on the highway and we're freaking out. We don't know what to do and we're running late because we have to break our fast in a different state every single day. And we couldn't make it to Fargo in time. You know, it was way too far. So I literally jumped on Google and I typed in Muslims in North Dakota and Google said back, did you mean Muslims in Chicago? And we're looking like all through Google and we found an article um, that the first mosque that was ever built in the United States is in Ross, North Dakota, a town of only 30 people uh, or 38 people. Um, and Muslims have been living there since the 1700s. And I was like, what? I didn't know anything about this place. Like, I thought the first mosque would be in like New York, Chicago, Houston, LA, you know, huge cosmopolitan, metropolitan, multicultural city. But Ross, North Dakota? Like, what are you talking about? And so, I couldn't find a website for the mosque. I couldn't find an address, phone number. I even tried to like Facebook any Abdul or Nadia I could find on Facebook and I couldn't find anything. I just found this random article from a few years ago. So I looked on Google Maps and I couldn't find a mosque, but I found a Muslim cemetery. And I was like, well, if I have a cemetery, I can, I'm sure the mosque in North Dakota is not too far from there. So completely relying on some random intersection uh, of a cemetery on Google Maps, my friend and I, we drive three or four hours out to Ross, North Dakota. And so we get to Ross, the sun is starting to set and we have to hurry up. We know we can't find the mosque. We're frustrated. We're stressed out and we start arguing. And I was like, man, where is this place? Like, we got to find this. Like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And we're arguing and yelling and arguing with, with, with each other. And as we're arguing and yelling, I look outside my window and this pops out in, in the corner. Can you go to the next slide? So this was the mosque that we found. And you can see that little gate, you know, the moon and the star. And can you go to the next slide? And there was a mosque. It was almost like a toy mosque that had fallen uh, onto this prairie. And at, we're walking around. And can you go to the next slide? We found the cemetery. And we found Muslims that were, you know, Korean War veterans, World War I veterans, World War II veterans, Muslims born in the 1800s and the 1700s. And of all places, they were living in Ross, North Dakota. And I was born and raised in the United States and I'm a history nerd. I'm like, I didn't learn this in history class. I didn't learn about, I go to the mosque. Like I didn't learn about this in Sunday school. Like who are these Muslims? Like I didn't, I don't remember hearing about these narratives in any textbooks. And I would get frustrated because you go to the next slide. Um, this is the narrative that we often hear about Muslims, right? This is what I look like when I wake up in the morning. Um, but in reality, if I'm sure we all have Muslim friends. In reality, uh, a Muslim looks like this person on the next slide. Uh, and then the next slide as well. This guy is actually an imam you know, out in the Bay Area. These are the narratives of Muslims that we kept meeting throughout our trip again and again and again. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, and then the next slide. And then the, the next slide. These are the phases of Islam that we kept seeing again and again and again. And for us, it wasn't so much about, I'm, you know, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an activist. I'm not here to convert anybody, argue with anyone or anything like that. I just felt like these are the people I keep meeting and these are the people I grew up with. I am, why don't we see these narratives? And so rather than just like complaining and whining about it, we used our platform and our project to you know, travel and tell people about it. And it put me on this mission and it changed my life. And I quit my day job and I started traveling and I wanted to tell these stories. And so since then, I, I've done this project called I'm a Muslim, Ask Me Anything. And after Trump got elected, I very purposely sat down with my agent and we looked at an election map. And we went, we looked at all the counties where Trump won by more than 20 uh, percentage points. And we said, okay, let's do shows in those areas. Uh, I'm not here to argue. I'm not here to debate or change people's opinions. I just want to tell stories about who I am and my upbringing. And I want to hear about other people. And what was interesting is I thought that I was going to be on stage changing people's opinions, arguing with them and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, I was learning a lot from them. And I thought people wanted to cherry pick, oh, what about this verse in the Koran? Or what about this and Sharia law? And what about this? And what about that? But People wanted to just know about spirituality. People want to know about faith and just m my take on the universe and all these other things. And we had these amazing spiritual conversations. And I performed at VFWs, uh, GOP centers, uh, student groups on campuses and churches and synagogues and all, temples and all these places. And it was just really cool. And every
through where we've gone. We've just had these amazing conversations. Thanks, Aman. I find it very striking uh, to hear about how you were getting all of these diverse stories of different communities out into the world. I know social media is a really important forum for you, but it sounds like actually meeting folks where they're at in GOP centers and VFW uh, centers was really impactful. And can you share with us any impacts you saw of those tours? Did you see examples of people changing how they thought or felt about Muslim Americans, though that wasn't explicitly your goal at the time? Absolutely, absolutely. The analogy I always use uh, is McDonald's. Um, you know, McDonald's for years and years, for decades, would always brag about how many people they've served, over a billion served, over 90 billion served, 100 billion served. And for decades, they were very successful. But what has happened in recent years? McDonald's is losing money. They've been struggling to compete. And it's not because Shake Shack, Chipotle, and Chick-fil-A, um, you know, try to counter the narrative of McDonald's. They just said, no, you've been feeding people crap for years and years and years, and we're just going to give people the stuff that they want. They want the good, wholesome, organic, all natural, the good stuff, right? Sorry, I just had lunch. But um, that's the stuff they want to hear. And that's what ignorance and hate is. Ignorance and hate is at McDonald's that we've been fed for decades and decades and decades, these narratives. So it's not that I went out to counter what this politician or this organization or this kind of hate and rhetoric that was out there. I was just here to tell people the, the good organic stuff. And those are the amazing things that have happened is literally like thousands of people have come up to us like asking questions. Like I remember we were in, um, this was in Topeka, Kansas. And there was a guy, he was the son of a preacher um, and he converted to Islam. And it was taboo in the small little town, the small little church community. And his parents didn't talk to him uh, for a year. And he lived at home and they, would, they wouldn't even like talk to him. They would be like, hey, can you tell your brother to pass the salt? It was like that kind of like tension. So his dad, the, the pastor in town, saw me on CNN uh, talking about this project and talking about these stories and got curious and went to our website, uh, read about our project, started following our blog, and then goes to his son's bedroom, knocks on the door and goes, hey, um, can you tell me a little bit more about this? I'm really curious. And they were able to rekindle that relationship. And we heard stories like this again and again and again, where people would, um, that didn't know about Islam or didn't know about these narratives, or maybe had some ignorant narratives before, were just pleasantly surprised. Um, and we, and I could go on and on and on, but a story like that is, you know, that's why I do that. That's why we tell these stories. Again, it's not necessary. My intent isn't to overtly convert people or change people's opinions, but there's no question that it's a wonderful byproduct. You know, I'm here to entertain. I'm here to, you know, make people think and appreciate a narrative at the minimum. Uh, but obviously it's an amazing, uh, blessing to change people's perceptions, uh, along the way, even though it's not overtly intentional. Uh, thank you so much, Aman. Um, I love your McDonald's <laughs> metaphor. Um, I think that really does speak to what we're talking about with affirmative storytelling. And though it wasn't your express goal, I think we can all learn a lot from what the power of affirmative storytelling can do for folks who normally we would, we may think um, that we could never reach them otherwise or change their their hearts or minds otherwise. But now we're gonna to turn to Terry. Um, it is important for communicators and cultural workers to articulate both the problems we face and the solutions we want. Uh, but the solutions are often shaped by political realities and are built off of systems already in place. So with constant attacks on our communities, it can be hard to take the time for visioning together, for deeply imagining what we want our world to become. Um, intelligent mischief, uh, Terry's organization is working on a new project that would do just that, invite people to immerse themselves in a vision of the future. So Terry, your project of WakandaCon taps into energy around the Black Panther movie and its fictional society of Wakanda. Um, can you tell us how the idea for WakandaCon came about and what it is? Yeah, um, yeah, and you know, thank you for having me on. Um, so before I go into WakandaCon, I'm just, I'm just like, take a couple steps back and tell 
how we got to uh, Wakanda Con and the creation of it um, and tapping that into the energy of the Black Panther movie. So um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so this is a representation for a project that we've been working on for the past few years called Black Body Survival Guide. Uh, and so this project was a multimedia project, uh, a narrative intervention that we came up with that was a response to uh, the tragic killing of Trayvon Martin um, and the, the trial of uh, George Zimmerman afterwards. And, you know, I, many people probably heard me tell this story before uh, who followed Tells Your Mischief, but as we were, as many, many people watching the trial or saw the verdict, it was surprised, uh, you know, surprised or not necessarily surprised, but uh, very deeply hurt, right? That such um, a tragedy could happen, just so bold-faced. And, you know, I had listened to an interview of the, one of the jurors um, who decided that George Zimmerman was not guilty. And what the juror has said was they admitted that Trayvon did no wrong. They didn't think Trayvon did any type of wrong, but they felt that George Zimmerman was a really good guy and that overall George Zimmerman's like purpose in life was protecting them, uh, i.e. A, a white person, uh, a person with a properly respectable white <laughs> person in the community. And I, what threw me back about that was just how again, like boldface that was and and just how blatant it was that like, well, what that meant was that Trayvon was um, collateral damage and any black person, no matter instead of guilty, was just collateral damage in protecting whiteness. And what that stemmed from was then that uh, Trayvon was then therefore deemed like a dangerous black body, right? Even uh, George Zimmer's uh, lawyer team, they really focused on Trayvon's body. Uh, they brought a cardboard cutout of him. So th the image of the body of the Black people being dangerous comes from like an uh, image and narrative, image and shape narrative. So, you know, it began, it started to be that we, we created this term called um, when reality gets absurd, it's time it gets surreal. Cause we just felt like all the, not only Trayvon, but a lot of the police killings and vigilante killings in black people and black people in general were uh, just ridiculous. The reasons that were given just seemed so ridiculous that you couldn't combat it with like rationale and logic. So we realized that what we were involved in was um, this just wasn't like a, a material, this was this was just a material battle. This was a what we call the imagination battle, right? The 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 imagination that white folk had and the system has of black bodies is just that they're dangerous and to be exterminated at, at any cost. So we we decided to like, how can we have a narrative intervention? We just said like, well, we gotta combat this with absurdity. Um, let's just like follow out the logic of, of itself. And that's when we came with the Black Rights Survival Guide because we said that, well, there must be these lists of rules. If it's black people's fault, there must be these lists of rules that bear not um, obeying. So let's help them out by creating these rules and tips. So this is just an example of like some of the tips we came up with. Uh, so this is hands up at all times. And we actually came up with this tip uh, before um, before Ferguson um, and Michael Brown being killed and how like, you know, it was so that he had his hands up, like even this won't save you. Um, and we, you, you can tell by the, by the, the tip is kind of, uh, it's totally ridiculous if you're going to try to do this at all times to try to save your life, right? And that was the whole purpose of the book. So it became a book. Uh, we made videos, it's a complete multimedia project. We made some, we also did diegetic prototypes to make the tips real. And we we crowdsourced these uh, tips and, and created them. We, we got design labs, got different folks, asked them to share their experiences of being Black and, and living with racism and and how how to survive and we thought like think of the most absurd tip and what we started realizing when we did the project was um you know a lot of the purpose of the project was uh to help people feel liberated and deal with a lot of the grief and suffering that was happening through um dealing with this, uh, these different systems of oppression particularly racism um through using humor right and using humor to combat the the things the tragic things that were happening so and we found that was that was helpful, but we found ourselves it kept us stuck in a dystopia, you know. And and many people we when they came with the tips, we was like the tips just kind of kept going negative. So we even had to make an intervention and try to make the tips like okay, how could the tips be more empowering? And and from there, so even though we loved the project, we did the project was very successful. Um, we we was like this this has kept us stuck, right? We even did a, a art exhibit at Boston University. It was called uh, Survival Pending Renaissance. And 
and we was like, how, how do we get to the next level? How do we not just talk about survival, but how do we actually talk about people thriving? How we talk about Renaissance, which is like an explosion of creativity and often um, a relate to uh, a renewal. And we came with this concept of Black Renaissance and saying this age of movement building and things and all other uh, things going on, explosion of creativity and diversity, Hollywood and all that, uh, that did, we're in the stage of Renaissance, but how do we capture that and move forward? And that's when we stumbled onto our next project because the Black Renaissance project, we made the mini paper and it like really go far. So next, next slide, yeah, ladies ahead of me. <laughs> um, we stumbled on WakandaCon. Um, and how we stumbled on this was that, you know, I myself, I've been collecting comic books since I was five years old, uh, self-admitted comic book geek, nerd, blurred, whatever you want to call me. And I love, always love Black Panther. And I swore, I anybody who loves comics you always imagine like what what happens if these comics are real they came to the screen and when marvel announced that they was making a black panther the movie i i had made this announce i was like no people really if they see wakanda in real life they see black panther on the screen people would lose their minds i truly felt this because of like what what was the images it was presenting what was the um different type of future that it would show people right those stories that had never been seen before so uh, I myself, along with um, some folks for Television Mischief, um, Aisha Schillingford, uh, Calvin Williams from Movement uh, Strategy Center, and Rafaro uh, for Mobilized Immigrant Vote, we had actually come together and said, like, hey, it'd be interesting if we could, like, mobilize this energy that we were predicting would come from people uh, being excited about the movie. And what we did first was uh, set up some movie screenings. Uh, well, we, we, we provide like a listing, create a Facebook group that create a listing of the movie screens that are going on. And we would call it that WakandaCon. Uh, we say like all these people come together, like we have to have something that unified this as an event. Why were people excited about this movie? What was the different things that captured people's imaginations? And we just kind of put feelers out there. We like put questions up and people were responding. Uh, people started joining the Facebook group. People were posting what movie screens they had set up in their town. They was all black movie screens usually. and. You know, it just it just kind of caught on. So then afterwards, we was like, well, obviously this energy is not disappearing. How can you like still focus even more? We was like, well, what do we actually have, uh, actually make what kind of con real, right? So we go to the next slide. Next slide. Sorry, thank you. Um, and we so then we put out there that like, well, let's actually have a con, right? Like a comic book convention, uh, but some that's focused on through the narrative of uh, Black Panther and Wakanda and the the imagination that it brought forth out of people. And so we picked Oakland, uh, half of our teams in Oakland. We picked the summer 2019 uh, to actually hold a real Wakanda con, and that actually caught caught on as well. And um, uh what we saw was that people wanted we, we actually did a survey of our group and we found out that people kept going back to see the movie and that people on average people saw the movie four or seven times and what people kept saying was like they want to actually like live in wakanda and we said what does that mean right like this place where like black people never colonized they were never enslaved where they're free it's afrofuturistic like people want to actually experience that so bad they want to live it so we we want to provide this like forum which could serve as what we call like a freedom dream factory where people could come and meet each other and actually discuss real life solutions to actually how can we make wakanda real and that that's what we came like this is the renaissance itself this was like people interacting with some they saw a pop culture, but then having the desire to make it real. So we wanted Wakanda Con to be sort of the focal point to actually make that project real and actually pe have people like play out what they were dreaming in their imaginations. Thanks, Terry. And I want to just follow up on something you said at the end there. But why is visioning so important for our movements? And what is the power of visioning through a product of pop culture? Well, visions move any like popular and progressive movement in history it is what has it done besides offer another world that's possible right and with that you have to have the vision to see that right we haven't we haven't reached that other world but every progressive movement what you actually offer to people is that the world you live in sucks it can be better we can make it better you can actually live that Right. And you have to make people believe it. You make them believe that through their vision, through the imagination that you offer. Um, can you go last slide for me? And one way I'll give an example how 
be before we even like say like we will do an actual con of Wakanda Con, our first intervention in that and try to help that real was that we created a Black Panther viewing guide for folks. And many people even uh, have reported to us that the viewing guide, they read it, it was to help people like critically analyze the narratives that they were seeing on the screen and also related to in a comic book. So this was actually like this guide we helped people, we helped guide people's imaginations and critical analysis as they saw the movie, which I think made the connection for the more real of like, how could the issues you see in the movie actually be affecting, how could we affect these things in real life, right? So uh, movements, imaginations, you can't move anyone unless they could actually like envision where to go. So that's always been like what movements have done. Um, just some historical examples, um, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, I think we see ourselves in the line of, of this action. Frederick Douglass, um, he was one of the most photographed human beings of his time, right? And what French Douglas has been recorded saying, um, he said that he took so many photographs because he knew part of uh, like freeing black people and and part of that liberation process was changing people's imagination and image of black people, right? What we're dealing with was like black people were not even considered human beings. For Frederick Douglass, photographs of self would always look dignified as photographs so that people could see that black people were human, that people could not deny that. And he understood how much image shaped the narrative. Well, it would shape people's imaginations, which then changed their behavior, right? And so like, if Frederick Douglass was alive today, he'd probably be all over Instagram and wherever the latest technology would be. Thank you. Um, we wanted to now open it up for questions from the audience. Just a reminder for listeners, you can submit a question by typing it into the question box on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Um, so we'll invite, give you all a second to do that and invite questions now. Okay, so our first question is, sorry, Elizabeth, were you trying to get in there? Nope, nope, you're good. Okay, um, our first question is, what are some of the most important lessons from your work that could inform other activists and artists uh, who are trying to overcome uh, the fear narrative being used right now? I think that is both for Terry and Amon. Uh, yeah, I, I can start with that one. I know I, I can only speak as from an artist's perspective, and I think especially when telling, especially nuanced stories about people of color or different faith backgrounds, there's always a people always want to be careful, right? And as we should to to make sure we're nuanced, to make sure that you know it's accurate, representative, this and that. For me, I just want to tell real stories, right? And I think as far as changing people's perceptions. I think that naturally that'll come um, with, with that. And so I, I try not to stress about it because I feel like if I'm on this mission, oh, I'm here to change people's opinions, I might sound like a corny public service announcer. Like, yay, I'm a Muslim, I'm American, we're awesome. We're just like you guys. Like, and it's not fun, it's not entertaining. Like, I don't want to watch or listen to that over and over. I don't want something preachy that sounds like an 80s like PSA or something like that. And so only from an arts perspective, I, I try not to obsess over that because if – you can tell it's hard to explain with words, but you can tell when something feels real. You know, Black Panther felt real, right? It, it felt like an authentic narrative. You know, a show like um, I'm trying to think of a, of a good example, uh, Fresh Off the Boat, or um, Master of None, or this movie coming out, Crazy Rich Asians. Like these narratives feel real. It's hard to really pinpoint what exactly is different. Um, I mean, there's many things, of course. Um, but but I think if the prism I always use is, does that look like me up there? Does that sound like me? Or does that sound like somebody I know? That, that's always been my prism. And as long as I accomplish that, um, those are my objectives and making sure that those narratives address uh, this whole fear thing. Because I, I try not to obsess over that because to me, I don't want to compromise the art uh, as well. Right, I would just um, I just totally back that up, <laughs> um, and yeah, because the only thing I had to add to that was just the same thing. Like stories, the authentic stories are the ones that provide people uh, some sort of connection. If you can make people feel a connection to that, 
that's what moves people. That's why stories move people. So in order to move people from, I believe the story was like, how do you help people, the opposition move beyond? Um, you have to find like, so what's the, what's the thing that connects them that pulls them over understanding that like, there's, there's no fear, you know? Um, I'll, st I'll stop there because it's just, yeah. Thank you. And our next question is, uh, in sharing affirmative stories that counter the negative stories you hear, is there a way to help opposition people move beyond seeing the affirmative as exceptions to the rule? And Julie, you might want to weigh in on this as well. So I'm struggling with the wording on that. So the, the can you? Yeah, let me just rephrase it. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so uh, there are some cases where we might put out affirmative stories, but but folks who are in the opposition camp might see those um, affirmative stories as folks who are exceptions to the rule that most folks, for right. example, that you get what I'm saying? Um, so the most yeah, folks are, are not that case. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and so there's a couple of things packed in there. Um, one is that we do know that if there's just a, a focus on individual stories, you know, if we only focus on like individual one or individual two, much like the local news is structured or much like actually a lot of the news is structured, um, audiences, and this kind of goes across the board, research has shown, will focus on that individual and they will make uh, decisions about what they think the solutions to the problem are based on that individual story. So it'll either be we should fix that one problematic person or in the case that you're talking about, we should celebrate this person, that person, why can't everyone just be like that person? Why can't everyone in that group that I am worried about or afraid of just be like this one success story that I'm seeing? So one of the ways to, to, um, to work around that, I guess, is to tell these group stories, to tell the stories about going around to you know, a number of different mosques all around to show this diversity of how, um, how people uh, who are in the Muslim community look and act and talk and all of those things to show that people are, um, that just more representation obviously of any given group can sometimes eat away at that, that focusing on just the individual story and, and, and celebrating that one person. The other point though is that the opposition is not necessarily, is pretty much not our, our, our target audience. Folks who are set in their ways in that 17% that I was talking about, who are very likely to see any of these stories and remain unmoved for whatever reason. Um, and maybe we do move a few of them, but we all have limited time and resources. So for those of us who are focused on mobilizing and have strategies around trying to um, persuade, uh, the opposition is not our, our, our audience, but rather the rest of those folks who um, answered those questions in a mixed way or, or, you know, have some positive feelings about diversity and some questions, who have some understanding that discrimination occurs and worry about it a little bit, but also worry that, um, you know, ha are prone to some of the arguments on the other side. So how do we, our, our challenge is how do we ignite those positive the positive sides of their brains, the positive stories that they have going. And I think what we've heard today are, perfect, are really good examples of how to do that. You know, in some cases, more among the kind of base and persuadables that are closest to us, but in some cases that move into, um, you know, persuadables who, who are a little bit more divided. Um, yeah, just to add to that, um... I remember I was in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, I think Trump won there by like 20 or 30 points. And we did this event. And after the show, this uh, guy who was wearing a Trump a Make America Great Again hat uh, came up to me. And clearly, he, he, you know, he, he'd vote for Trump and he mentioned that. And he said, well, you know how you're on, you are on stage just now just talking about how people should take the time to understand Muslims and what the narrative you see on television is not what it's in reality and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah. And he said, well, I think you should do the same for people that voted for Trump, that we're not all these like crazy yokel, um, buck tooth, you know, whatever you want to call people. Um, you know, there is some nuance and there's people that agree with some things and disagree with some things and this and that. And what he was basically saying is, you know, he, you don't have there, there's more there's more narratives out there and so I don't even like using the word opposition because 
I, how can I expect someone to take the time to listen and understand me when I'm not taking the time to listen and understand them? Does that mean we have to normalize hate and normalize xenophobia? Absolutely not. Um, but I, I do think, and again, I'm only speaking for myself, um, I do think I have an obligation uh, to, to at least take the time to hear people out. That doesn't mean I have to agree or accept it. Uh, but if I'm not giving them that courtesy, then how can I expect them to extend the same courtesy to me? And I've had people come up to me and say, like, hey, man, I didn't agree with a single thing you just said just now, but I had fun. Great. Mission accomplished. Like, that's all I want. I just all I want is people to take the time to hear me out. Um, and I, But I think in order to do that, um, it's important to take the time to listen and understand people. Again, that doesn't mean you have to accept or normalize and be like, oh, they're just like us. You know, we're no different. No, there's there's clearly like hate, bigotry, and rhetoric out there, and we should never accept it. We should always reject it. Um, but I do think um, when, when using the word opposition, if I'm here to say like, oh, we're not this one monolithic group of people, I shouldn't paint people that may disagree as a monolithic group of people as well. Thank you. Um, we have a qu another question for all the speakers. A part of the challenge with using affirmative storytelling is that we're often forced to be on the defensive and forced to react and respond to situations rather than be proactive. So how can we use affirmative storytelling in situations that come up unexpectedly and urgently? Um, so talking about rapid response, one example pulling from another question is the current ar arguments in being heard in the Supreme Court against the Muslim ban, um, and how do we tip the scale during these unexpected and urgent situations? Oh, um, I can weigh in on that. Sure. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go oh, ahead, go ahead. I, I was. This is Julie. Sorry. I was just going to say that I think that um, one of the most important things is to not wait until the, there is a situation that rapid response is needed in, but rather to be laying the foundation of these these stories, these vision, this affirmative vision, and this long-term narrative over time. Um, we get caught up in being reactive so much because there's so much to react to. But if we can, in all of that, always be starting with that vision, starting with, you know, remember, if we're successful, this is what the world looks like, and then go into the more short-term communication, um, that drumbeat is necessary. Otherwise, we're just always going to be reacting, I think. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, um, and to echo what I was uh, saying before, uh, I think it's important to tell stories that are evergreen and, and timeless. It just so, like, for example, Black Panther, and as you mentioned before, like, he's been obsessed with Black Panther since he was a kid. Uh, it just so happens that in today's pop culture, Black Panther has uh, even more re resonance given all the racial injustice and equity that's been happening over the past couple of decades. Uh, but it's a timeless story that could be appreciated in the 1910s as opposed to, you know, in 2018. And the same goes with Muslim narratives. Like, yes, it just so happens to have resonance, you know, given the bans and all these policies and local and state issues and this and that. Um, but I, I think it's important to not tell things in response because no matter how good of a response it is, it's still a response. You're still in somebody else's shadows when you're trying to counter something. So I think it's important to, yes, Things are going to have more renaissance given what the political, cultural, and social climate is at the time. But I think as artists, it's important to tell stories that are timeless. You know, narratives of people from all different walks of life are always going to be something that are appreciated. It just so happens that it might get a few more eyeballs over others given what's happening on the ground. Yeah, I just want to quickly echo everything that everyone's saying. Like. Um, I know for the, something we struggle with as a progressive movement is a lot of times where we're stuck in the short term uh, uh, and we're stuck in a tactical, right? So then that's that is why we find ourselves often in like rapid response uh, situations. But we we have to start with visioning. We have to start with proactive uh, affirmative storytelling, right? We have to um, we have to start building the infrastructure um, for serial storytelling that puts people in the world we want to live in. Right. And so we may not have the same amount of money as, say, the opposition or mass media, but we have like a, a wide uh, distributed network of movement organizations, of independent papers. We have um, even like other media outlets that are like progressive as well. And we have to like combine this um, network to like 
create a coherent narrative, right? Which then begins to create the world we want to live in. It creates like, puts people in that world, right? And that's why, um, you know, that's where, for me, the lot of work we do is starts with like visioning and just like proactively being like, okay, what's the story we're gonna tell? And every successful movement has always put out the dream, the dream world, the, the vision, somewhere people could move to. And that's what's always moved people. Uh, another question for all speakers um, is that currently there are multi-billion dollar global communication efforts and mass media that uh, forward a lot of the narratives that we're trying to um, reverse or change. And so what would you suggest are strategies in the face of these massive communication efforts? Like how, how can we compete with that? Um, yeah, just to go back to it, um, I, I don't really see it as a competition. Like I said before, people want the good, wholesome, all natural, organic stuff. Like Insecure on HBO is one of the best shows on television and won tons of buzz and tons of response. It wasn't necessarily a counter to any particular narrative, just Issa Rae and her team is a very talented creative and they just want to tell dope stories about uh, black millennial women living in Los Angeles. Um, it's not necessarily to counter this, this or that, like people are hungry for this stuff and there's an audience for it. You know, your Netflixes of the world, your Hulus of the world, your uh, YouTubes and all these other platforms that are popping up, there's more and more opportunities to create it. And so for organizations, you know, how can we compete necessarily? It's just amplify these shows, amplify these voices, support these artists, tell people to watch these shows, you know, don't let them get canceled when they're on the brink of a bubble, like, you know, good, an audience is always there for something. So I think that people just want the real stuff. So it's not, I don't necessarily see any of this as some kind of a competition. Um, everyone's entitled to these resources, but it's just a matter of just telling the truth. It's just a matter of just telling those authentic narratives. And that's the stuff that people are hungry. And those are the shows that are winning awards again and again and again are the ones that really feel like, oh yeah, that's me up there, or that's my homegirl up there, or that's somebody I grew up with. Like people want those narratives. They want to see themselves on TV and there's more and more of those stories popping up. And again, they're not in response to anything. Do they have more interest in modern day because of what's whatever's happening? Sure. Um, but they're not really done as a competition. They're just dope, talented people that are telling stories that feel real. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that as well. Um, and we got to understand that anything, it, you know, it seems like, you know, like we said, like the mass, the mass media, global communication, opposition, like, it, it seems like all that seems very daunting, right? It's a lot more money on the other side. And there, a lot of times, a lot of media uh, produces, um, it perpetuates and produces stories that uh, keep keep going the different systems of oppression, different um, isms, right? Uh, but we got to understand that anything that's popular connects to people, where that's a positive connection, where we see the example of the Black Panther movie um, and, some, and also like movements that pop up and people attract to it, they see images and or a dark connection where we get, um, you know, number 45 in office, right? Right. Those things connect with people. So the question we have to ask ourselves in order to combat that, what are what what's the what's the real story? What's the connections that we can make? What's the authentic stories? What's the um, what's the values that people have that would progress further to our um, our vision in the world we want to see? Right. When you could connect to that, it, it doesn't matter about money. Right. Like it's about even taking advantage of the new technologies that are out. Like, so I gave the example of Frederick Douglass. In Frederick Douglass Day, photography was the latest tech. That was the latest thing that's happening. Families were going to get pictures taken together, right? Instead of getting drawn. So um, it was also about like movements need to be up on what's new technology and also like, how can we flip that for us? So we've seen a lot of success with that with the different social media. And there's a lot of like the dark side of social media, but it's also about how how do we how do we flip it for our own good, right? So it's not it's not either or, it's really like a, a game of jujitsu. Um, we're fortunate, one of the things that's actually, we're fortunate enough to, live in this like um 
this is gonna sound oxymoronic, but <laughs> live in a in an overly developed advanced uh capitalist economy. A lot of bad things come with that, obviously, as we know. But the thing that also comes with it is to get people to buy a lot of stuff that they don't need, they do a lot of research into what are people's desires, right? So we actually have the opportunity. Pop culture is just this like desire laboratory that we could figure out. We could take that and then use it for our own needs. So it's a, a game of jujitsu. How do we actually use that multi billion dollar global communication um, infrastructure against its own self? That's how we see it. And Janelle? I just really quickly would want to say that I think that, you know, for a lot of folks who are working in, particularly in the media, which can be, seem like a dark place sometimes, and, and those of us who are, you know, embedded in some of these issues, I think we do tend to see and consume more of the really negative things that, because they are harmful to a lot of the stories we're trying to tell. But I think that it's important to go out and, and remind ourselves of the positive things too that a monetary just mentioned because um, that can give, give us a little bit more of a reality check that yes, there are positive portrayals, there are good stories, there are people doing you know this really good work and there are people consuming that. So there are folks who appreciate that and want it and not just the folks who are, who are maybe um, echoing some of the really harmful stuff. Thank you. Thank you all. I think that's going to be the end of our questions uh, today, but I want to just offer a big thank you again to Julie and Mon and Terry for sharing their knowledge with us. Um, if you have any questions about today's material, feel free to reach out to me or Elizabeth Johnson. We're also sending you a link with this recording as a follow-up so you can share that with any colleagues who couldn't make it today. And as you close out of GoToWebinar, a short evaluation will pop up, so please fill that out so we can make sure we're offering the best possible content to partners in the future. Thank you so much again for joining us, and have a great day.